It was the summer of 1985, which for many here, I guess, seems like a million years ago. I was sitting in the office of the Dean of Students. I was in Pasadena, California, and I was talking with him, but I wasn't, I wasn't called in for bad behavior in this, in this particular instance, but I was there talking with him about a young lady that I was dating at the time. I'd been uh, seeing her for about five months, I believe it was. And it's fair to say that I was uh, completely taken with her. Her name's Carol, by the way, if you're wondering. Uh, and, uh, but I had a bit of a conflict arising because I had made a commitment to transfer to another college campus uh, this, that coming school year. And so we would be apart for nine whole months, which at the time, of course, may as well have been nine years. But as I shared this uh, story with him, the Dean of Students quickly, that was his style, he said, well, I can see two scenarios playing out here. It's either going to be absence will make the heart grow fonder, I, went, I like that one, or it will be out of sight and out of mind. Now, I think that was the first time that possibility had ever occurred to me. I was like, what? I, wasn't, I was a little bit unsettled by that, and I certainly didn't like the sound of it. So that's a bit of a story about a beginning of a relationship, and we're going to talk about relationships today, not so much about a relationship between a husband and a wife or uh, within uh, the church, although we will talk about that. But number one, I want to start by talking about our relationship with God. People ask me sometimes, where do you get the ideas for your messages? And I usually, truthfully, well, not usually truthfully, I always try to be truthful. <laughs> I'll say, well, usually it's something I feel like I need to work on, and that's the case uh, here. And I was thinking, well, what sort of relationship do I have with God? How close am I with God? So we're going to talk about that today, but let's jump back to the human relationship side for just a moment. You know, when you talk to married couples and you ask them, you know, when did you start uh, dating or what attracted you to the other person? Or you might say, here's the key question, who liked who first? And usually you get some good-natured bantering back and forth between the husband and wife. I see one person out in the audience today, congregation today, who uh, told us their story years ago. And it was quite an entertaining story. But there was some back and forth about who liked who first and how that all played out. It was quite entertaining and interesting. Uh, so this issue of going first in a human relationship, in human terms, oftentimes the person who goes first sometimes doesn't see that interest returned. And sometimes that can make that person a little bit needy. Like, well, but I really want you, I really like this person. I think this is gonna work out, but the other person never picks up on the vibes. They don't respond. And so sometimes humans get a little needy and they start doing a little ankle grabbing, as we sometimes call it. Now, when it comes to our relationship with God, God, of course, is not needy, but God did go first. He did make the first move. If you would turn to the book of John, this is a very well-known scripture. We talk about it a lot, usually in a slightly different context. John 6. And let's start reading in verse 44. Probably should keep track of the time. Or I guess if you guys all walk out, I'll know that's time to stop. Something like that. So in verse 44, Christ is responding to a question. He says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. This word draw in the Greek can actually mean to drag, to pull something out. I've read that the, an analogy could be a pulling a knife out of a scabbard. So when God calls us, when he draws us, he's pulling us out of where we are, and Mr. Johnson's talked about this and putting us into some other place. I'm probably not doing justice to his explanation, but it's something along those lines, I think. And he goes on here, and I think sometimes I have failed to keep reading, and maybe because we tend to focus on 40, verse 44, we don't see what's talked about in verse 45. 
It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. But then the next verse, or the next section, is what caught my eye as I read this time. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Sometimes, perhaps, we don't look at this part. We, we focus on the drawing, which is right. But there's also a hearing, and there is a learning that takes place from the Father as we begin to come to Jesus Christ. So again, as I said, you know, Christ, God, made the first move in this relationship, but it doesn't make them needy, not in the least bit. In fact, when it comes to relationships, God approaches it in a way that I, I would suggest that none of you try to approach it if you're starting a relationship or beginning a relationship with someone right now. You probably don't want to go down this route, but God can do it. He can pull it off because he's God, and that is this. God, but while he initiates the relationship, he commands us to love him. Now, I don't know how many of you spouses out there early on in the dating process commanded the other one to love each other, love you. I kind of doubt that happened. But God does that with us. And we find that in what is often called the first great commandment. If you would turn to the book of Mark, and we'll look at chapter 12, and we'll start in verse 28. Mark 12, verse 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Here's Jesus Christ, our creator, our savior. Obviously, he's there to speak God's words. Here's what he said. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, of course, this as a uh, quote from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Verse 30. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Now, when I read this some weeks ago, when I first put this message together, I thought, well, that's a lot. That's a lot, that's a big ask, as they sometimes say in today's vernacular, but that is the commandment. If we want to be in a relationship with God, <clears throat> Christ tells us here what it will take. It will take our all. Let's take a moment, because I can't help myself from doing this. Apparently I'm a word nerd, so we'll, we'll dig into each of these words to see if perhaps we can get a little bit more uh, flavor or depth. That first word, heart, According to Vincent Ward's study, the heart refers to the seat of the affections and also the center of our complex being. Affections. Think about that word affection. Who do you feel a sense of affection for? Do you see someone at church perhaps or perhaps some other event and you look across the room and you see someone walk in, you, sometimes you feel a sense, oh, there's so-and-so. I haven't seen him or her for years and you feel I want to really want to go talk to them you have a sense of affection for that person and you like being around them a question I ask myself I ask all of you as well do we feel that way about God do we have a sense of affection for God so God Jesus Christ we believe of course because God tells us it's true they're sitting on their throne in heaven right now along with a myriad of angels and do we think about God and that relationship and do we feel that affection for him? The second word used is soul. And it's often used in the New Testament it's in, in its original meaning of life. But some commentators say that the, world, the word denotes life in the distinctness of individual existence. So I would maybe paraphrase and say our own unique selves, every person in this room is unique in their own way. And God is asking or saying that we have to love him with all that that is. We can't ride, as we've heard many times, we can't ride the coattails of someone else. It is about us, our thoughts, who we are. The third word there is mind, and it is the faculty of thought, it's understanding, but especially the moral understanding. I think it's fair to say that it's whenever we are faced, and we're faced constantly, 
with moral decisions to make. We're always, with all our mind, trying to think, well, what would God want? What is God's way here? And then the last word, strength, according to Gill's exposition of the entire Bible, with all thy strength, again, refers back to Deuteronomy 6. And he says, it is with the greatest vehemency of affection. There's that word affection again. Have you ever thought of having a vehement affection for someone, but more to the point, having a vehement affection for God and Jesus Christ? Sometimes, I think as humans, God and Christ sometimes, because we can't see them, they can be a bit abstract sometimes. But I think this is telling us that we need to be so close as to truly feel a very strong, vibrant affection for them when we think of them, when we consider their will and their way. Now, having said all that, I don't know, of course, what you're thinking. Uh, we don't have the pop-up video back made famous some 30 years ago, was it? VH1, is that the channel, VH1? Mr. Gus would remember that. I'm not sure he would think that's where it was. But when we hear all these things, this command, this first great command, sounds pretty challenging, at least it does to me. And let's look at a few of those challenges um, briefly. Going back to the summer of 1985, the dean of students says, tell you what could happen, could be out of sight and out of mind. Let's turn to the book of 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. 1 John 4, verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? God is out of sight. We can't see him. He's up there, but we can't see him. So it can be hard to love someone, or in this case God, if you don't see them because we are so attuned to using our five senses. What's the second reason? Well, let me, uh, before I go too much further, uh, let's read an alternate version here. A New American Standard Bible render, renders it this way. If someone says, I love God and yet hates his brother or sister, he is, again, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Very strong language and the Cambridge Bible says that the seen brother and the unseen God are putting us put in a striking juxtaposition in the Greek. John is making a very strong point about how these two things can be quite different. There's another challenge that we also face, God's characteristics. He's omnipresent, he's omniscient, He's omnipotent, sometimes trying to think about God and trying to get your brain to wrap around the reality of his incredible power can be a little challenging. So perhaps we struggle with that sometimes. A third challenge I've already referenced, so I'll just repeat it briefly. God has asked us to love him with all that we are. Mr. Burnett and Mr. Bynum mentioned baseball, so I'll mention basketball, get a little equal time. Uh, back in the day when I used to still play basketball or try, the one thing I came to realize is I didn't have a lot of talent, but I loved to play. And I realized that I could find a sense of happiness if I came off the floor and I felt like I played, I'd given everything I had. If I didn't have the talent or didn't have the know-how, okay, I couldn't quite help that. But I felt like I'd given my all, I, I could live with that. And I'm sure that everyone sitting here knows and maybe you're very good at giving your all. But when you give your all, you usually feel good about it. But it can be challenging. A fourth challenge, Romans 8, verse 7. This is one of the fundamental scriptures, I think, particularly when we first, if you're counseling or thinking about baptism, this is a scripture we have to embrace or consider. Romans 8, verse 7. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So we are, if you will, cursed for lack of a better word, <laughs> probably not the best word, but we, we have to overcome this reality. And sometimes that old man 
You know, he doesn't want to die, and he wants to keep popping back up at times in our lives, and if that's the case, then loving God, of course, can be challenging. Years ago, I heard a sermon by, by, sermon by Mr. Uh, Larry Greider, I think it's Larry, uh, and he has a really, had a really wonderful way of speaking, in my uh, opinion, and he made the statement, said, I hope that what I would say is encouraging, but I hope it's not discouraging, and I can't mimic the way he said it, but he, he phrased it in such a way, his voice was uh, very distinctive, so my point is, I'm not here to discourage you, I just issue these challenges or share these challenges, but of course, I wouldn't go any further without saying we can, of course, overcome all these challenges. If you would turn to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. 1 Peter, chapter 1, we'll start reading in, in verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, that now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. But the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And here's the, here's the punchline, if you will. Whom, having not seen, you love. So Christians can overcome this lack of visibility, this lack of being able to see our God and our Father and our Savior. We can overcome it. We also can turn to the book, if you like, you don't have to turn there, but I'll read it briefly, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. We do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. God has given us the power to look at things that can't be seen. Now, for those of you who are sci-fi fans, Marvel comic fans, whatever, you do have a superpower. You can see things that others cannot see. And finally, uh, in this set of scriptures, if you would turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 19. And I'll start reading in verse 23, Matthew 19, 23. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. So dealing with a particular situation here. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. But let's drop down to verse 26. And, of course, his disciples were saying, well, what, who can be saved? In verse 26, we get one of the most inspiring scriptures of them all, and there are many. Verse 26, and looking at them, Jesus said to them, with people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So no matter what we are wrestling with, no matter what challenges we have and maybe developing a stronger relationship with God, with God, all things are possible. Of course, our challenge is to give ourselves to God so that he can make those things possible. But with that said, let's ask an important question. Okay? This is a question you probably ask if you were starting a relationship years ago when you first started dating your now wife, for example, or husband. <clears throat> Why should we love God? Why should we want to be in a relationship with him? Now, maybe that sounds like a dog question. We're all here today. Many of us have been in the church for many, many years. But why? I think it's a really important question to ask ourselves anew, particularly as we talk about, as we heard a little bit briefly from Mr. Burnett, and we read the news and we hear what's going on in the world right now. We don't know what's going to happen in the Middle East, of course. Only God knows. But... If there's ever been a time for us to redouble our desire to have a strong relationship with God and to know why it is we even love him, is it now that time? But that said, let's take a moment to look at the, the world of human studies and medicine and what they can tell us about why we should want to be in a relationship. These are some findings, some benefits. This is from Northwestern Medicine, an arm of Northwestern University. Here are a few of the things that committed healthy relationships, the benefits that they can bring in the human realm. You can have less stress. Being in a committed relationship is linked to a lower production of cortisol, which is a stress hormone. That's a physical finding from the physical world. Number two, better healing. Whether it's having someone there to remind you to take your medicine or having a partner to help take your mind off the pain, research suggests that long-term partners 
are three times more likely to survive three months after a heart surgery than others. Now, my point here today is not to discourage folks who are single. In fact, I think it's probably a good reminder of all, to all of us that as the body of Christ, as the congregation, that we need perhaps to be a bit more mindful of those who are perhaps in single, perhaps they don't have a family around them, uh, and that we are to provide that love and that support, and I'm sure that it happens every day, as it is. So we want to make sure that we don't leave someone behind, so to speak. Healthy relationships lead to healthier behaviors. We're going to run through these quickly. Number four, they lead to a greater sense of purpose. And number five, a longer physical life. So returning to the question of a relationship with God, because that's the focus, why should we love God? Well, John, in the book of 1 John, chapter 4, we read the prior verse, or the latter verse, if you want to turn to John, 1 John 4, verse 19, in a very succinct fashion, John sums up an excellent reason why we should love God. He says we love him because he first loved us. Now, as I put this message together and I tried to test myself and see my shortcomings, as I shared earlier, it occurred to me, maybe more than it has in recent times, that I need to have a truly deep appreciation and a love for God. Not just kind of an abstract, well, God is good, God's got a great plan, sounds good, I'm in. I mean, that's, I'm being a bit facetious, right? But I think we need to have a very deep appreciation and a love of God and what he does and what he is like and what he's doing on this earth. If we don't have that, when the stress has come, when they get intensified, I think we're going to have a challenge. So we need to work on that now. And I think that one key is to meditating on some of the things and some of the ways that God has loved us. And let's take a moment today to share a couple of those. And you guys could come up with 20 ideas of your own, all equally valid. But here's a couple that occurred to me as I tried to think about this. Because God the Father drew us out of this world. Now, we talked about that briefly at the beginning, but I'd like for you to take a moment to consider that. So there was a point in time, God the Father, Jesus Christ, sitting on their throne. And of course, I don't know exactly how this worked and how this happened, but he looks out across the, the great, vast universe. You know, humanly, you can't even see the earth. You can't even see us. And yet somehow he looks down from heaven above and he says, I want that person. I'm going to take that person. I'm going to take that person. And he pulled us. He drew us out. So think about that. It's incredible. It's mind-blowing. And, and it's easy to know it intellectually, but to appreciate the great God of the, cre uh, of the universe, the creator of the universe, he picked you. He picked your children. For those of you who have children, uh, as we know, he makes your children holy. It's an incredible thing. So there's one thing, perhaps, you, it might be good to think a bit more on if you haven't thought about that. Here's another. Because God the Father did not let Christ's cup pass from him. We're very familiar with the scripture. It's found in Matthew 26 and verse 39. Christ is praying, as the, song, the hymn renders it, with earnest desire. And he asked God, you know, if it's possible, could this cup pass from, from me? And I, again, if you just stop for a moment, imagine God's plan hangs, if you will, to a degree in the balance. I know I'm using a bit of imagination here. And God the Father hears Christ utter these words. Could you let this cup pass? And of course, we know the answer he didn't. Um, God the Father said, no, you must go through it. Despite his incredible love for Jesus Christ, his perfect son, said, I want you to go through it. He didn't waver. I'm sure all of us have wavered at times, those of us who are parents, or maybe those of us who are bosses, maybe we had a rule, and eh, maybe I'll change the rule right now. I just, yeah, I might, you know, the, your son, your daughter, or whatever, they're having a hard time with it, and you maybe, ah, maybe I'll fudge on it. God the Father did not fudge on it. 
and because of that, we all sit here today with a hope of eternal life. That's an incredible element or an incredible way that God has shown his love for us, and perhaps it would be helpful to consider these things uh, more often. I know that I probably need to do that. Now, for the sake of the time, I, I have a few others. I'm not going to spend as much time, but I will, I will share a few others here that occurred to me, but I do encourage you on your own time to think about maybe it's a different act of love that God talks about in his word that really resonates with you. You know, find what that is and think about it. But here are a couple others. God Almighty, of course, we know that reality, no one could force him to do what he did. He did it willingly. Sometimes when we get semi-forced or nudged into doing something, maybe part of us doesn't really want to do it, but we do it anyway, grudging, begrudgingly, I guess is the word. But there he was, sovereign. As we know, he could raise children up from stones, but he did not do that. He did it. He chose to do it. He did it freely. So there's another one I think is in very encouraging and another reason to have a deep love for God. Here's another one. He chose us, though most of us, we know the scripture in Romans, do not come from a famous, powerful, wealthy lineage. Not many of us descended from captains of industry. We're just pretty much average folks. So getting back to that idea of being drawn out of the world, I think of it this, this way. Imagine Someone goes into a shop full of things to buy. There may be some sort of mechanical thing. And as you first walk into the, into the shop, there are all the new shiny latest editions with all the latest features. So God the Father, using that metaphor, walks into the shop and he looks at that table and he takes a couple. But he keeps going. He says, can you show me where you keep the older equipment, the things that aren't working quite so well? the things that are in the state of disrepair, and he goes and picks those. Now, I hope that doesn't sound too discouraging, but God does say that not many mighty are called, not many noble. So if you maybe use that thought process, in a sense, that's what God did. He came and said, this person, that person, etc." Here's another one. Sometimes as human beings, it's very tough to, to do this. He loved us without merit. Sometimes we do pretty well at loving people who merit our love. You know, it's easy if your son or your daughter or perhaps your, your spouse or whoever, a friend, and that, that person, man, they always come through. Man, I love that guy. I love that gal or whatever. It's easy to love then, but it's not nearly as easy when they do something you don't like or perhaps they do something that literally hurts you, right? But God was in that way. He loved us regardless. And the last example I'll share is, sometimes as humans, we want to be part of a special club. We want to, because it makes us feel good. Now that's a human nature kind of thing, but God did not have a members only approach. We know that he has a plan, we know it involves timing, but he's inviting everyone in his time. Everyone will have the chance. God is not a country clubber. No disrespect if you happen to be in a country club, but he, that's not his mindset. So we can get in. Some people can't get in, right? You don't have the right credentials, you don't have the right amount of cash, you can't get in. But that's not how God sees our calling and his love for the world. Making good time, I think we're going to get out early. Now I'd like to share some keys that I think can be helpful to help us love God and build that relationship with him. First one is very simple, but sometimes it's challenging. What is that? Belief. If we don't believe God exists, well, it's kind of hard to have much of a relationship with him. You know, back in the summer of 1985, I was only able to see Carol a couple times in that nine month period. I don't know, this is a human example, but I never had any doubt that she was there, right? And if for some reason that doubt had entered my mind, if I began to think, you know, this person writing me these letters, I don't even think it's her. <laughs> Someone's pretending to be her, and they're playing with my emotions. But 
joking aside, we have to believe that God exists. Hebrews 11.6, you can turn there, of course. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and sometimes perhaps we stop there, but we shouldn't, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Do we really believe that part? Is God a rewarder? Do we just say, oh yeah, absolutely. God, not, there's no doubt in my mind. I've seen it over and over again. A second key to building a strong relationship with God, again, this is no epiphanies here today, communication or contact, if you will. Harking back to my example when I was dating, you know, I'd, we'd never been separated before, so I didn't really know what to expect. I certainly thought, well, we'll stay in touch. This was well before these things came along, and there was no internet. So, you know, that dialing on the phone and writing letters, for those of you who've never done that, uh, that's how we did it. No smokes, no smoke signals. But I did think we would communicate regularly. But she surprised me greatly and in a very encouraging way. She wrote, I would say, four to five letters every week. And that just blew me away. Now, what guy doesn't want to get four or five letters in the mail every week? Uh, so that was incredibly encouraging. And of course, it wasn't just the fact that she wrote a lot. It was what she said in those letters, which was also encouraging and made me uh, think even more highly of her than I did at the time. And that's true of our relationship with God. Again, no, not rocket science here. If you would turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 55, and verse 16. I remember the first time I heard this was back in college days. I don't remember which teacher it was, but this was, I was just learning how to begin to have a relationship with God. So I thought, oh, okay, this is, that's how you do it. Psalm 55, verse 16, as for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. God hears our voice. We seek his will. And this speaks, of course, to a frequency, three times a day. It's not a command, but it's a good idea. It's a good practice. Uh, I've tried to do it. Um, not saying I've done a great job of it, but that, that instruction that I received many, many years ago has stuck with me. And I suspect that sometimes you do, many of you, if maybe all of you do this, maybe you do it even when you're driving around. Sometimes you're busy, it may be tough to find a lot of time, we're not talking about taking an hour uh, to do this necessarily, but it's frequency, it's a constant desire to talk to God and to let him hear you. Also in the book of Psalms, if you turn to chapter 119, verse 97. Oh, how love I thy law, it is my meditation all the day. Now again, we have busy lives and we probably can't just sit all day long and go through God's law. But we've certainly been encouraged in recent months and weeks to be mindful of God's law, to value it, to understand how important it is. And here the psalmist is saying that he loves it. Now usually when you think of the word law, Sometimes our, your immediate reaction is, oh, it's something I gotta do, I can't do this, I can't do that. But as we grow in our relationship with God, as the psalmist did here, certainly he did not see it that way. How do we see God's law? Is it a burden? Is it a bunch of no's? Or is it a way to protect ourselves and to have the happiest, most wonderful life we can possibly have? It is and should be, of course, the latter. So we have these very straightforward examples of what we need to do to maintain that contact. But again, I stress the word meditation because I, just my gut, I could be wrong. I wonder if meditation may be the least used tool in the spiritual toolkit of a Christian. I don't know, uh, but I do think with a busy life and constantly, eh, 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 maybe, maybe we don't take the time we should. A third key. You, we need to be a willing and enthusiastic spiritual traveler. So I would say that many people in the room like to travel, uh, but it's probably better said that you, you like to get to a destination that you want to see. The travel itself, you know, 
putting all the suitcases together, dragging them in the car, if you're flying, going to the airport, doing all those things, it's not necessarily that much fun. It's the destination that we look forward to. And I believe that God wants us to be, we are in fact sojourners on this earth, we need to be willing, enthusiastic, spiritual travelers. And how do we do that? By traveling where God wants us to go. And we do that by, of course, listening to his word and going where he takes us. If you think of the example of Jesus Christ, Christ sought his father's will. And that, quote, took him on a trip, if you will, that involved his death by crucifixion. He set aside what he wanted. We talked about this briefly earlier about that desire to have that cup pass. He said, no, I'm going to go where you want me to go. I'm going to travel the road that you want me to travel. When we talk to one another, I suggest that that is something we can all strive to do as well. When you have a conversation with someone, I would ask yourself, how curious are you? Are you really curious about the other person or are you really not that interested? Some of us are probably more curious by nature, but you need a sense of curiosity to to learn about other people. You need to think, well, what's going on with this person? What is going on in their life that I have no clue about? How did they come to the church? Whatever, whatever the subject is. But, and that is a type of travel. As the old saying goes, you'll walk a mile in their moccasins. You have to listen to them. If we don't listen to one another, we'll never know what the other person is feeling. And we're not going to be taking any trips, if you will, to what their life and what their life is like and how can we connect as the body of Christ if we don't do that? We have to travel. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now that word way could have also been translated road. I don't know how many times we've thought about Jesus Christ as being the road, but again, getting back to the metaphor of travel, he is that path, following him, going where he wants us to go. It's a trip. It's a trip. You know, we, we're going somewhere. So that is an important thing to strive for as well. Are you an enthusiastic and willing spiritual traveler and going where God wants you, but also listening to other people in conversation and experiencing what they're experiencing so you can have more empathy for them? Now there's a fourth key, and to look at this fourth key, we need to go back to where we started. If you go back to the book of Mark, chapter 12, verse 28. This had never struck me before, and I hope I got this right. I being, I'm willing to be rebuked, of course. That's happened more than one occasion, but I think I understand what's going on here. Mark 12, verse 28. Christ was asked a fairly straightforward question. What was the first commandment? And he responded to that. But he did more than that because he, as far as I can tell, unsolicitedly, is that a word? Uh, without being asked, those are words, he apparently added a second commandment, or he did add a second commandment. And he said in verse 31, and the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the question would be, that wasn't what he was asked, so why did he say that? Well, let's go to another scripture that we've already looked at, because I think John, the Apostle John, helps explain it as well. And we're turning back to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20. Again, reading from the New American Standard Bible, we've read it before. If someone says, I love God and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. I mean, that's really, really strong language. For the one who does not love his brother and sister whom he has seen can't love God whom he has not seen. It's stated as a fact. So this is the Apostle John saying this. So when we go back to what Christ said, I think it makes sense that I think he realized that the, the, the question was actually incomplete. The question about first commandment was a great question, but you can't really separate the two. You can't have one without the other. It is interesting that the beginning of his answer was, behold Israel, Lord our God is one. And I think in one sense it's right to say 
Those two commandments are one and they're inseparable. So we have to love our brothers as ourself and as Christ loved us. That's found in John 15, verse 12. If you want to turn there, Christ speaking, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Here's another tall order. Well, how did Christ love us? If you sat down and wrote an answer to that, you come up with all sorts of wonderful answers. Here's what I came up with, a bit of a summary. I came up with four ways he loved us, at least in that singular act of his sacrifice. Number one, he sacrificed things that were dear to him. His spirit body, of course, when he left heaven to come down to earth, he gave up a spirit body. The spirit body that all of us are here are so desirous of possessing. He set it aside. I would say that's a pretty dear thing. Of course, once he became a human being, he gave up his physical life. So that's one way that he loved us. He sacrificed something dear to him. A second way is he endured tremendous physical pain. Now, as I tried to think about this, I thought, well, how many times have I endured significant physical pain on behalf of someone else? I'll, I'll share one example in a moment. Um, it's not just me, many people in this room have done the same. A third way he loved us is he endured injustice. We know that he was sinless, he was innocent, and he was led off like a common criminal and his life brutally taken from him. And number four, we've actually talked about this a little bit before, he gave unmerited love. Again, we struggle sometimes doing that because if someone's not doing things that we are doing things we don't like, it's difficult to love them. And yet, we were all sinners. Uh, some of us were not yet born, but we were going to be sinners. And he, he committed this incredible act of love nonetheless. I was going to briefly mention this, this idea of enduring physical pain. And granted, this is that one singular act. But I will say this, you know, maybe sometimes we think, well, we can't compare to Christ. And of course, that's true. But I will say this, parents... Any parent who's raised a child and has been sleep deprived, who's carried that child in their arm until the arm starts to uh, ache, right, Jared? Uh, and uh, not getting enough sleep and maybe doing without something that you'd like to have because you know the child has to be taken care of. We all, many of us have done that. Many of us also, as adult children, take care of aging parents. And that is also physically taxing at times can be, and so we do sometimes experience this physical distress, this physical pain, so it's not like it's not happening, but we shouldn't feel like that's too tall an order for us. But as we think about this, in my opinion, I don't think it's a reach, Christ in his sacrifice demonstrated perfect love, and he rolled those two commandments, if you will, up into one incredible act of doing and fulfilling them both, if you think about it. He loved God the Father with all his heart, mind, and soul because he did his will. He stopped, even though he asked for the cup to pass from him, he stopped, and I'm imagining it had to be something like this. He thought, well, wait a minute. That's not what God the Father wants. He wants me to go through this terrible death so that I can love and show love to all of us and all the many billions, as we've talked about on the last great day many times, that they will have the opportunity. And I think we could also go back to that scripture where we were commanded to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I wonder, perhaps Jesus Christ thought at that time as he was wrestling with the, the enormity and the challenge that he faced, did he stop and think perhaps, thought, but all of these human beings, they have that heart they have that soul, they have that mind, they have that strength. And if I don't go through with this, they will never have the chance to be part of the God family. I've got to do this and I've got to do that for them. That's my imagination of what might have been thought. I, I don't, of course, know and I can't say that for sure. But nonetheless, I think, as I said before, his example of love is the perfect fulfillment of keeping those first Two commandments, love of God and love of mankind. Well, as I wrap up here, 
This foundation, or the foundation for this message, was the first and great commandment. But as I got further into it, I realized I needed to add a bit more, and that was the second great commandment. It is a command to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I think it is, is a, perhaps a compass check, if you want to use that phrasing, that maybe all of us need in a time of stress in this world to redouble our efforts to strengthen our connection with God, our relationship with God, to know that God is just a prayer away. He's there to help and he will help and to feel that strength and that with God, all things are possible.